Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Elmhurst College. Uh, my name is Alan Ray, and I have the privilege of being president here. I have the honor of welcoming you to one of our year-long series of lectures uh, addressing the topic of education in crisis. I think this is an especially timely topic uh, for higher education to debate. Our series is bringing some of the country's brightest minds to our campus to offer their thoughts on questions like these. What makes schools work? Which reforms have paid off and which have fallen flat? How ready are our schools to educate children with special cognitive and affective needs? What's up with educating boys? And uh, what's the future of massive open online courses? And what do they mean for traditional on-ground colleges like ours? And of course, uh, what should be the relationship between science and art in our schools and in our lives. A very timely topic this evening. And to begin our presentation tonight, Professor John Jeffrey of our Department of Computer Science and Information Systems is going to introduce our speaker. Please welcome Dr. Jeffrey. Thank you, President Ray. Uh, it's my honor to uh, introduce our speaker tonight, Julia Keller. Uh, she is a novelist, a journalist, um, teacher currently, and um, a determined polymath. I love that word. <laughs> as a cultural, uh, as a cultural critic of um, in the Chicago Tribune for many years, she won the Pulitzer Prize, and wrote essays and stories about just about anything, <laughs> and uh, including literature, music, television, science, and sports. She's taught at Princeton, Notre Dame, the University of Chicago, and Ohio University. And with her skills and perspective of a nat being a natural synthesizer, she uncovers the commonalities of science and art, which is our talk topic tonight. Um, Julia is an author of uh, Bitter River, which is, came out in 2013, which is a second novel in a critically acclaimed series uh, set in her home state of West Virginia. And uh, in two, I believe this summer she has one coming out, the Summer of the Dead, yes. okay? And uh, that will be coming out in, I believe, in August, yes. okay? Life, but... Okay, <laughs> all, right. all right. And in 2005, she was a cultural critic and a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, and um, she won the Pulitzer Prize for her feature writing for what the judges called a gripping, meticulously constructed account of the April 2004 a uh, tragic tornado uh, that killed eight people in Utica, uh, Illinois. Um, she was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University and a McGraw uh, Professor of uh, Writing at Princeton University and has served four times as a, ju a juror for the Pulitzer Prizes. Her reviews and commentaries have aired on national public radio and also at the NewsHour on PBS. So it's my honor to introduce uh, and have her come up now uh, and present Science and Art All Together Now at Elmhurst College. Hello and good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight. We were just, we were sitting here just a moment ago looking out. Is there a more perfect scene and a more vivid example of what our colleges and universities are than just looking right out there across the, the greensward? And I was looking, there was one student out there, uh, two students passing a ball back and forth. I mean, it looked, there was a kind of a timelessness about being on a college campus. I mean, obviously they're up to the minute and they're urgent and all the questions that President Ray mentioned um, are, are all being discussed. You know, you can, you can kind of even feel the hum of a lot of great minds working, even as we're sitting here tonight. But at the same time, there is this timelessness, this sense that we're all sort of connected, I think, by this quest for knowledge and for community and for the kind of eternality that uh, the great ideas sort of bestow upon us. You know, a few years ago in an event much like this, I was asked to give the commencement address at my alma mater, which is Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia. Now this was, as you well imagine, as you can well imagine, a great honor for me. Me decked out in a distinguished looking black robe and my always unruly, naturally curly hair smushed beneath a mortar board. There's, and a serious look of it seemed to guarantee that there were a lot of big thoughts simmering in the head beneath it. 
um, I knew that I would be addressing the very same professors whose classrooms I had been in you know, some years before. And I think to myself, either they don't remember me at all, or if they do remember me, I'm sure had no sense of a special destiny that was lying in wait for me. So this was payback. <laughs> no, actually, I was very honored. I was very excited. And I was determined that I was going to give an address that was going to be lively and erudite. It was going to leave those esteemed professors agog and leave the students inspired and grateful for all of my wisdom. So what happened? What happened was this. I blew it. Now, I don't mean that I tripped coming up the steps or that I mispronounced the university president's name. Nothing like that. In fact, the, the speech was, was very well received, the commencement address. There was a dutiful applause, and no students, at least so far, as I, so far as I heard, asked for a refund of their four years of tuition at the end of it. When I say I blew it, I mean that I used that commencement address to articulate a particular idea about education, particularly higher education, that I now would completely reject. There's been such an evolution in my thinking. My message to the graduates that day was simple. I told them that going to college does many things, but it also does one important thing at, at the center of it all. It teaches you how to think. The specific facts you learn, this is what I argued, aren't really important because we all know that facts are changing all the time. They're changing at the speed of light. They're changing all around us before we can even really get a grasp of them. So the facts aren't important. What's important is learning how to think. This learning how to think is a takeaway from your time on campus. But I was wrong. Because the truth is this. We learn to think, usually around kindergarten. The minute you start matching up shapes and colors, learning to tie your shoes, learning to tell time, discovering the magic of, of, of reading, you are, you're thinking. You're learning how to think at that point. We do that for many, many years. A college education is different. It has an entirely different function in our lives. College is about the content, the complexity, and the sophistication of that thinking. It's about the raw materials of that thinking. Education, I like to think, is a noun, not a verb. What colleges ought to do, what the good ones are already doing, have done, and will continue to do, is to give you material to think about, historical facts, mathematical axioms, truths, sort of eternal, unchanging truths, information, context, all of these things that are, that are out there and graspable. It ought to tell you something you don't already know. I mean, that's kind of a novel concept, but if you think that in our world today, very rarely are we confronted with things we don't already know or think we know. We kind of seek out, I think it's been proven in a lot of media studies, we seek out those places that are just going to reify and validate what we already know. We go to the cable stations that are going to argue our politics already. You know, rarely we turn the dial and go to the, go to the station that's saying something completely opposite. The elements that we should be concerned about in an education are the very things that energize and propel and engage our thinking. Now, two things helped me change my mind after that day of giving the commencement address. Two things made me believe I was dead wrong about this learning how to think business. The first was a conversation I had with a friend shortly after giving the commencement address. My friend is a doctoral student in biology at the University of Georgia. And I was telling her about giving the speech and how exciting it was to go home again, in effect. And I, I, was, I was trying to be sort of suitably humble about it, but I really, of course, it was a, it was a faux humility. Um, <laughs> And I thought she would nod and listen to me and smile and say, oh, aren't you clever? Aren't you wise? Aren't you incisive? Well, she didn't say that. She didn't nod and she didn't congratulate me. Instead, she thought about it a bit. And then she said, you know, that's all well and good, but you've got to have some actual facts in there too. I haven't spoken to her since that day. No. <laughs> Actually, I appreciated her remarks because it really started me thinking in an entirely different way about what we mean by a college education. Education, to put it in popular terms, needs some there there. It needs some bone to work around the connective tissue of arguments and ideas and debates, those sorts of things. Now, the arts and the humanities split the educational universe right down the middle. And this gap has been getting wider and wider and wider, as we all know. And what gets lost in that gap, I think, is this bone, this bedrock, this, this essential something that's at the center of an education. And I say something, not as an abstraction, but just because it varies from field to field, of course. And it's not a healthy development at all. It's not healthy for the individual. It's not healthy for the community, for the nation, and certainly not for the world. The second thing that changed my mind took a bit longer to manifest itself in my thinking. Now, I've been teaching narrative nonfiction writing at Ohio University for about the past two years and taught at other places as well. And previously, as uh, John mentioned in the introduction, I've taught at a variety of other places, too, during my time at the Chicago Tribune and when I was getting my uh, graduate degree at well, as well as at Ohio State. 
So I, I say that because I want to assure you that I do have some sense of, of a representative sample of students. You know, I'm not popping off with no, with no basis for this. Now, my students were then and are now, by and large, curious, diligent, intellectually able. They're very, very good students. But I've begun to notice a peculiar thing. When these young people, even though they are good writers, they struggle when it comes to a selection of what to write about. They are fine with personal essays. They definitely have very, very strong, vibrant opinions about politics, about pop culture, and they love to write fiery articles thereof. But when I ask them to write about something real, something beyond their own opinion, something that reflects more than just an individual sensibility, they're somewhat flummoxed. I would say to them when I, when I would stare out at the class and I'd see these puzzled looks and you know, sort of shaking of the head, I would say, there is an entire university out there at your fingertips. Go find a professor who has been working a very long time on something you don't know about and go ask them about it. Because we all know the very best teachers love to share what they know. They love to share their ideas. Go find one of these professors, I would say. Go listen to what she or he is devoting her or his life to and write about it. Well, they would just continue to stare at me. So I would elaborate. I would say, for instance, go find a professor at the medical school who is working on new combinations of, of drugs to provide chemotherapy for cancer patients. Or go find an exercise physiologist who is working with amputees to develop the next generation of prosthetics. Go find a physicist who spends half the year at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland, back testing the existence of the Higgs boson. Go find them. They're out there. They're waiting for you. Their office doors are open, although not always true. Sometimes professors go elsewhere in the afternoon. We know they're hard to pin down. But generally, there they are, and they're waiting for you. More blank stares. At this point, generally, one brave soul in the back of the room would, would raise his or her hand and say, hey, we're, we're journalism majors, we're English majors. What do you, what do you expect? What's, all, what's, what's with all this science, economics, math business? What do you expect from us? As if that settled the matter. But as I explained to them, that certainly did not settle the matter. These students know very well how to think. They can write wonderfully well. But they've been segregated so early in their education, often to what we call the humanities track, that they didn't have to pay much attention to these other fields that I mentioned. In the same way that a lot of our science majors get, get shunted over into the holding pen of the sciences, and they don't have much truck then with the humanities. Now, those of you who know your cultural history right about now will think, well, she's hardly the first person to point this out. Famously, in 1959, C.P. Snow, who was a novelist and scientist, gave a very famous address at uh, Cambridge University. And he alluded to two cultures. He called it the two cultures. Now, he argued that our age of increasing specialization, now this was in 1959, just imagine, you know, 2014, that this age of increasing specialization was bringing about the death of a common culture, a culture we all share, a sort of public pool in which we all can take a dip. He argued this with passion and with prescience. And it's gone on to become a real seminal moment in, in the history of education and educational theory. Now, I should say at this point, too, that uh, some of you may be thinking this, this reminds you a bit of a 1987 book by University of Chicago professor Alan Bloom called The Closing of the American Mind. Now, that's something rather different. He argued, in a sense, the same thing. He was complaining that, that we don't have a common culture. But he was attributing it to what he saw as a drift toward relativism, a drift toward um, undermining and not, not celebrating the works in the Western canon. His argument was a largely political argument. That's not what Snow meant, and that's not what I mean. The chasm between the arts and the sciences these days is an altogether different dilemma, because it, to my mind, it really isn't about the dangers of propaganda or students being taught political things that we, that we don't want them to hear at this point. The problem is that we, professors and administrators and, and fellow students and parents and friends, have lowered our expectations for today's students and for ourselves. We advise people to select a major that will lead to a high-paying job, or these days, any job. And then we say, OK, you're done. We don't encourage people to take advantage of the rich intellectual blend that thrives on every college campus, that splendid symphony of the arts and the sciences. We've instilled a kind of narrowness of vision, I think, in, in our students, even in an age when so many wonders abound and so many questions remain to be answered. It's as if you swiped somebody's glasses and then pointed to their eyes and at a rainbow and said, OK, describe it to me. All they see is a blur, and it's not really our fault. Again, we've, we've taken their glasses. Back in 1959, Snow wrote that he saw a world with, quote, literary intellectuals at one pole 
and at the other, scientists. And between the two gulfs, and between the two, a gulf of mutual incomprehension. Sometimes, particularly among the young, hostility and dislike, but most of all, a lack of understanding. He went on to say this, quote, in our society, we have lost even the pretense of a common culture. Persons educated with the greatest intensity can no longer communicate with each other on the plane of their major intellectual concerns. This is serious for our creative, intellectual, and even our normal lives. It is leading us to interpret the past wrongly, to misjudge the present, and to deny our hopes of the future. It is making it impossible for us to take good action. Now, in the roughly half a century that's passed since Snow gave that address, the gap has only widened. Now, granted, the reasons for that widening are good. It's because of the, just the fantastic advances we've made in our scientific and technical world, advances which are breathtaking and beneficial. But it is a gap nonetheless, and it is worrisome. Now, there's a bit of an irony here. This split is occurring during one of the great ages of what I would call the humanization of science, when those who possess the most extraordinary scientific minds spend an inordinate amount of their time writing books to make their work accessible to those of us without specific training in that field. They don't have to do this, but they do. I'm referring to people, and these names will be very familiar to you. I'm sure you've read their works as well. People such as neuroscientist Steven Pinker, or biologist E.O. Wilson, or mathematician John Barrow, ornithologist Tim Burkhead, physicists such as Brian Greene and Lisa Randall and Lee Smollett, the late Sherwin B. Newland. University of Chicago professor Jerry Coyne's books on evolutionary biology are lucid and provocative and accessible to anyone. On the other side of the coin, a great many of our gifted nonfiction writers have been specializing in scientific topics of late, from John McPhee to Barry Lopez to Tracy Kidder, Elizabeth Colbert in The New Yorker, and the late Peter Matheson, whose death a few days ago was was a tremendous loss to both literature and to fields such as anthropology and comparative theology and history. My point is that even in this age of necessary specialization, an age when a granular focus on a single aspect of the most arcane field is necessary to make a significant contribution to that field, we still can have a common culture. We still can have a place at which all can gather and all may reap the rewards of moving beyond our comfort zones to engage with these new and challenging ideas. Now that place doesn't just happen. It has to be created. It has to be imagined. And then it has to be nurtured. And it has to be protected and fought for against all the naysayers, all the many and varied people who say, pick a major, get a degree, nab a paycheck, and call it a life. You know, there's a wonderful anecdote about Carl Sagan, another great popularizer of science, of course. In his case, the field was astronomy. He was on a train to Washington, D.C., and they arrived there, and a porter helped him with his bags. And Sagan tried to give him a tip. And the porter refused it. And Sagan said, no, no, I want you to have it. And the porter said, no, you've already paid me. And he added, you gave me the universe. I love that story because it speaks so eloquently of this common fund of knowledge, this sense of discovery that we all can share. Now, chances are that porter had never appeared through a telescope had never explored the constituent elements of a supernova, but he knew what Sagan had given him. Sagan with his books and the television show and his lectures. Sagan brought the stars down to Earth. He made the cosmos comprehensible. And he brought it all down to where the porter lived, where all the rest of us live. And at the same time, Sagan kept the wonder and the mystery and the scientific rigor intact. You know, an often cited impediment to this common culture that I've been talking about is the pace of change. I mean, think how many times you hear it. It's like, ah, you haven't got a chance. Just hunker down. Just hang on for dear life. Change is coming too fast. You can't do anything about it. And while it is true that this change, this rapid, inexorable, bewildering change is all around us, it's not the only truth that surrounds us. Earlier, I mentioned John Barrow, a professor of mathematical sciences at Cambridge. In his marvelous book, the constants, the constants of nature, he wrote this. There is a sense in which all the change and unpredictability is an, an illusion. It is not the whole story about the nature of the universe. There is both a conservative and a progressive side to the deep structure of reality. Despite the incessant change and dynamic of the visible world, there are aspects of the fabric of the universe which are mysterious in their unshakable constancy. It is these mysterious, unchanging things that make our universe what it is, 
and distinguish it from other worlds that we might imagine. It leads us to expect that certain things elsewhere on Earth will be the same as they are and have been, that they will be the same at other times as they are today, that for some things neither history nor geography matter. Indeed, without a substratum of unchanging realities, there could be no surface currents of change or any complexities of mind or matter at all. I was always so captivated by that paragraph. I thought it, it seems to fly in the face of everything we're told today about change. You can't possibly do anything about it. It's swirling around you all the time. And Barrow is suggesting, yes, and, and there is this other truth, this other reality. A golden thread weaving a continuity through nature. That's one of his phrases that he, that he repeats, a golden thread weaving a continuity through nature. And what a succinct, hopeful idea that is, an idea that anyone can visualize and appreciate. Anyone can reach out and grasp. Knowledge that takes us beyond what we already know does more than merely educate us. I would argue that it also provides an essential consolation, a healing balm, a way of coping with adversity, the accumulation of tragedies that we all are going to face, whether we have yet or not, the, de the deaths of loved ones, smaller sadnesses such as divorce or the loss of a job or physical infirmity. Now, if you don't believe me about that, maybe you'll believe Merlin. In this passage from The Once and Future King, the fantasy epic by T.H. White that made a pre-Harry Potter wizard named Merlin and his pal King Arthur household names, Merlin gives us a bit of life advice. The best thing for being sad, said Merlin, beginning to puff and blow, is to learn something. That is the only thing that never fails. You may grow old and trembling in your anatomies. You may lie awake at night listening to the disorder in your veins. You may miss your only love. You may see the world about you devastated by evil lunatics, or know your honor trampled in the sewer of baser minds. There is only one thing for it all, then, to learn. Learn why the world wags and what wags it. There is only one thing which the mind can never exhaust, never alienate, never be tortured by, never fear or distrust, and never dream of regretting. Now note that Merlin doesn't specify whether this new thing to be learned is a scientific fact or a literary insight. He does not tell us whether it should deal with Sir Isaac Newton or Shakespeare, whether it should be an algorithm or a sonnet. The key is that it must be new and it must be difficult. It can't be what you already know. It can't just validate what you already know. The arts and the sciences are mutually enhancing, not antithetical to each other. They complement, they don't contradict. Now, I should add here, of course, they seem to be contradictory but in the short term, but that's only because we don't stick with it long enough. Here's what I mean. Most of us are generally happy to be alive, give or take a few irritations or setbacks. We're pretty thrilled to be right here, right now, and we'd fight very hard to stay alive, to keep, to keep death at bay for as long as we can. It's in our nature to want to survive, to prolong our existence. But to understand just what sort of astonishing miracle must occur in order for us to be right here, right now, we need the expertise of a scientist to give us a more complete picture. In the early 1970s, a physician named Lewis Thomas began to write a series of brief, lyrical, pungent essays for the New England Journal of Medicine. He later collected these into a book. The title was The Lives of a Cell, Notes of a Biology Watcher, and I'm sure many of you have read it. It used to be on the, the reading list. A lot of, a lot of um, freshman classes were, were assigned to read it. It was a literary sensation, a huge bestseller. And it was the beginning of what I've referred to as this kind of golden age of scientific writing, scientists writers and writer scientists of pioneering individuals who cross back and forth repeatedly, and at will, between this gulf between the arts and sciences. In one ecstatic, yet scrupulously factual paragraph, here's what Thomas wrote. Statistically, the probability of any one of us being here is so small that you'd think the mere fact of existing would keep us all in a continued dazzlement of surprise. We are alive against the this, this stupendous odds of genetics, infinitely outnumbered by all the alternates who might, except for luck, be in our place. Even more astounding is, this, is the statistical improbability of this in physical terms. The normal, predictable state of matter throughout the universe is randomness, a relaxed sort of equilibrium, with atoms and their particles scattered around in an amorphous muddle. We, in brilliant contrast, are completely organized structures, squirming with information, isn't he a great writer, squirming with information. We make our living by catching electrons at the moment of their excitement by solar photons, swiping the energy released at the instant of each jump 
and storing it up in the intricate lo loops that make ourselves. To have sustained this effort successfully for the several billion years of our existence without drifting back into randomness is nearly a mathematical impossibility. Now, if you add to this the biological improbability that makes each of us, each member of our species, utterly unique, and you are, you are now in an entirely different universe. Each of us is a self-containing, freestanding individual, labeled by specific protein configurations at the surfaces of ourselves, identifiable by whorls of fingertip skin, even by special medleys of fragrance. You'd think we'd never stop dancing." End quote. You know, and one thing I really like about that paragraph is when you think of all the things that divide us and all the ways we are sort of sliced and diced and chopped up, we, we identify with race and gender and class and ethnicity and all of that. This is about none of that. At bottom, here is this, this fundamental sense of humanness that really has nothing to do with all those things that the politicians like to, like to divide us with. So my hope for education and for the students of today and tomorrow is that they are encouraged to rove beyond the borders of what they already know, to rove beyond their particular majors and their current interests. I hope that the poets take microbiology and the microbiologists are reading Shelley and Keats. And I should say too that the scientists that I've, that I've been fortunate enough to know always surprise me because every time I ask, what would you have been if you hadn't been a scientist? One was an astrophysicist friend of mine at Harvard and I would, I would say to her, so if this physics thing hadn't worked out, what would you have? And she said, mm, a filmmaker. And uh, I ask a, I, went to the Large Hadron Collider, I mentioned there I was doing a story for the Tribune in Geneva, Switzerland. I actually crawled down inside the LHC before they sealed it up. And I was down there with a physicist, an Italian physicist, and I said, so again, if this physics thing hadn't worked out, what would you have done? And she said, oh, concert pianist. Again, I was stunned. I was thinking math or something else, but it was, it was invariably the arts, something in the arts. And what pushed them one way or another was, who knows, you know, a great teacher, I think, Teachers are, 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 the great, uh, are the great unacknowledged legislators of the world. To those who say, I should, I should end with this, because you're probably thinking this right now. It's like, okay, Keller, and you're probably like my students. You're thinking to yourself, okay, fine, but there simply isn't enough time. Life is short. There isn't enough time to, to go into all these different subjects and such. I generally say to them, if there's time for Facebook and Twitter and the Kardashians, then there's time to learn about mitochondria. There is time to learn, as Merlin put it, why the world wags and what wags it. And there is certainly time, as Lewis Thomas tells us, to dance. Thank you very much. I was hoping that at this point, too, we could um, kind of open up the conversation. I would love to hear your all's opinions about this. I said, as a, because I've been teaching for the past two years, one thing about being a teacher is you tend to sort of pontificate because you have this captive audience that has to listen because their grade is imperiled. But you are under no, you are under no, uh, uh, no obligation like that. So I'd love to hear your all's view of this. And maybe those of you who are in either the arts or the sciences, I would love to hear maybe about some of the great teachers that you had that turned you one way or another. My, my father was a math professor. And he, uh, one of the things that he would become angry at is people who were, who were intimidated by mathematics because of bad teachers. I mean, he really, really felt that a lot of really good minds were turned away from math just because somebody early on had told them that they weren't particularly skilled at it, which he, he felt that if you have a certain capacity, after that it's just a matter of personal taste. He would always say to me, Shakespeare could have been Newton, and Newton could have written Shakespeare's plays. It's just a matter of what they were interested in. You know, we'll, we'll never be able to back test that one, but I do think it's an interesting idea. Um, it's all a matter of using our capacities. Um, but as I said, I would love to hear what some of you feel about this topic as well, which I think is so essential to our education right now and some of the dilemmas we face. Um, if you have a question for Julia Keller, if you could come out to the side aisles. We each have microphones. If not, I'll just keep prattling on. Oh, <laughs> I just want to say I miss you. I miss you in the Tribune. Oh, well, thank you very much. You know, it's, I was going to mention that, you know, early on, actually, a, a, about that very thing. You know, at the Tribune, I was really privileged to get to write about so many things, like science topics. If you had an interest in something, you could follow the kind of golden thread of your curiosity. Um, but for me, it became a matter of kind of repeating experiences. And one of the things I, I think I live in terror of is of, you know, 
shuffling off this mortal coil, as Shakespeare would put it, before I had tried some other things. So I decided to write novels. And I know you're probably thinking, how do you go from working for the Chicago Tribune, where you're part of every day's discussion and you're carried on the wires and it's all about news and important things and all of that, to writing novels, which are, of course, over usually many years in gestation. And who knows if anybody's even going to read them, whereas the Tribune, we had a, I always like to quote Ezra Pound, who called literature the news that stays news. So in that sense, that's kind of what I'm trying to do now uh, with novels. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, I, really, I really appreciated uh, your different perspectives. And just what you're talking about here, dazzlement and excitement. I think you, for me, you were very joyful in your writing. And you made me want to read what you wrote about or learn what you were talking about. So thank you. Oh, no, I really appreciate that. It was a wonderful opportunity at the Tribune. I was there for about 12 years, and I, as I said, I just saw, I can't really say, I certainly wasn't one of those people that was um, negatively affected by the changes in the newspaper business. We see that. I mean, I, I, I you know, see, have, have seen that happen, and I don't think it's a, a particularly good thing, but it didn't affect me personally. I just said, said I reached that point, I really wanted to write novels. I've always felt that and I don't know why. If anybody can tell me why I feel this way, I, I, will, I will be in your debt because I'm asked a lot, why do you feel that fiction is a higher form than nonfiction? I'm not sure why. I think one thing I often say, and I think this is true, if you look at how we understand the past, we may look initially at history books and newspaper stories, but for that deep understanding, we go to fiction. When we want to know how the Depression felt, yes, there are wonderful books, wonderful history books and sociology books on the Depression, but to really know, we read The Grapes of Wrath. If we really want to know World War I, we read All Quiet on the Western Front or Birdsong or some of the really marvelous fiction books we have. I say marvelous, harrowing, but that give us that felt sense of life. So there's a sense at which fiction has a more difficult task, and, but at the end, the, the rewards are, are even richer. Speaking of World War I, if you haven't read, there's a novel by Irish novelist Sebastian Barry, A Long, Long Way. That was the, the novel for me that really, uh, you know, how do we understand World War I? You know, we're all, none of us were alive, none of our parents, were, none of our grandparents were alive. How do, we, how do we ever reach back and understand the past, and particularly a, an event, such a cataclysm like World War I? And the way is through a book like A Long, Long Way. Very short, very brief, and yet it will haunt you forever. Okay. There's a, are we, oh, yes, sir. No. Yeah, I had a question about, um, I, I believe in the benefits of a liberal arts education in college, and I think that speaks to what you were talking about. But I have uh, nieces and nephews going off to college, and um, in terms of the cost of college and also the pressure of getting a job, how do you convince them, rather than being sort of trained for a job, that they should uh, enjoy the, the benefits of a liberal arts education. You know, that's such a, we were talking about this um, just before the event tonight, right? It's so hard to say, you know, take your time and dabble, you're right. I mean, like my students at, at Ohio University, a lot of them are graduating with student debt of eighty to $90,000. I mean, this, this unbelievable debt. I just keep thinking of like this thing piled on their backs, you know, as they go forward, a debt that's really impossible to repay. Maybe they'll become tech billionaires, in which case they'll be fine. But for most of us, that is just an intolerable burden. It's a great question. The only thing I can say is, um, you, know, there's a, you know me, I'm always going to be quoting a poem. There's a poem by Theodore Rethke. It says, I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. I learn by going where I have to go. The thing I say to my students is, you don't know what's going to be the thing. What's going to be the thing that does get you that particular job? And if you are, if you are a person who has um, enriched yourself by, by taking courses that don't have an immediate economic benefit, it will come around somehow. And again, I, my students always look at me and say, yeah, it's fine for you to say you have a job. And it's a, it's a, it, it, that's in some ways, it, it's, a, it's an unanswerable retort. I mean, I understand where they're coming from. But I can tell you, I started out as a philosophy major. Can you believe that? I remember the day I told my parents I was going to major in philosophy. <laughs> you don't want to be there. You don't want to be there when you, <laughs> they're like, you're what? Um, my father said was a math professor, my mother's a high school English teacher, and while that sounds like it was this great intellectual atmosphere, in some sense it was, but there also was a sense, I mean, they were teachers. They didn't make a lot of money, and it was like, hey, you know, what are you going to do with that? They're not really uh, lining up to hire philosophy majors. Um, the switch to being an English major still had no idea what I was going to do. I've never had a journalism class. I mean, getting a job in journalism was very much a result of what I call kind of the bumble theory. I just sort of bumbled around, but I didn't just sit 
in my basement. I say that my room was in the basement, so it has nothing to do with, that sound like I was denigrating people who live in basements. I'm sure a lot of fine people still live in basements, so I applaud that. But I, um, I just kind of did things, you know? The first job, I, well, I, I would try to get things published wherever I could, I tell my students, and, and this does relate to your questions, whether or not they're interested in writing per se, I mean, be it music or any of the arts. You just kind of go out and do things. It doesn't mean that it's gonna be the perfect thing right off, but I'd sold some science fiction limericks to Isaac Asimov's science fiction, mag science fiction magazine for a dollar a line. Now, you know how long limericks are. That wasn't a lot of money, <laughs> all right? I'd sold three of them. So I was applying for a job at the Columbus Dispatch in Columbus, Ohio, and the, you know, the first, the, the editor's secretary said, well, no, we, we want five years journalism experience, we want all these clips we want, and I said, well, they don't have any of that, but I do write limericks. Now, had they had any sense at all, they would have called security, that would have been the end of it. But the editor, his door happened to be open, and he said, limericks, eh? C come on in. And I sat down and he said, recite them. So I'm in the editor's office reciting these limericks, and he said, can you give us a minute to think about it? Can you give us, I think he said he wanted like a couple hours or something. I said, no, I really need to know now. You know that bravado you have when you're young? You never have it again any other time in your life. And I said, no, no, kind of take me or leave me. Not with quite that degree of belligerence. But in the re I tell this story and a friend of mine always says, I got it, why didn't you do that at the New Yorker? You shot your one chance, you know, <laughs> on the Columbus Dispatch. But the point I make in general is nobody can tell you the path. You know, but if you are always leaning forward, I know it sounds like the Sheryl Sandberg book, Lean In. Actually, I think it's a very good book. Um, if you are always leaning forward, the, the good things will happen. Not right away, not in a way that I can predict. Um, I just think that you're better off if you're doing that. The answer to student debt, I think, is a, is a different issue. We have to do something in this country. This is my little political diatribe. I mean, I, I don't know what it's going to be, but people graduating with these crushing burdens of debt is simply not acceptable. Not in this country we've agreed that everyone, no matter their, their um, financial background, should have access to higher education if they're willing to do the work. We have to do something. That to me is a separate question. Um, what you really have to do, and what I tell my students, is just to keep that leaning forward and going forward. Read everything you can get your hands on about your field, find the new and different way to go do it. There is always a new way emerging. There's always something kind of burbling beneath the surface. You know, if it, I can't tell you the number of times people told me, you will never get a job in newspapers. You don't have any clips. You've never worked for a student newspaper. You've never had a journalism class in your life. What the, <laughs> what? Um, admittedly, it wasn't, you know, neurosurgery, but still, um, I think that you have to just have this kind of basic good-hearted belief, if you will, that things are going to somehow work out. You know, the great, there's a great French aphorism, which I can't say in French. If I did, those of you who know French would, would snicker at my accent. But it goes like this. It says, life always works out, just not in the way you think it will. And I, and I try to tell my students that too, because I hear the same things from them. I mean, very, very, I mean, these are really good students who have worked hard, and they're getting a lot of pressure from parents um, about what are you gonna do? Why are you majoring in this thing? That's where my, my bumble theory kind of, kind of comes forward. And there'll be something that'll happen along the way. There'll be something you take, something you study, where somebody will ask you about it at some point. And that'll be the thing that gets you in the door or, or wherever it is that you want to be. I really do believe that in the deepest, in the deepest part of me. I mean, I don't think I'm a, a sort of a, a wildly optimistic person at all. Um, you know, the great Horace Walpole line that uh, life is a tragedy to those who feel and a comedy to those who think. I think that um, I'm, <laughs> I'm one of these people that I probably um, uh, do a bit more feeling than thinking in that sense. I think there are certainly a, a lot of tragedies around us, but I do have an optimism about that, that if you keep leaning forward, going forward, uh, learning new things and challenging yourself to not be terrific at something and still going after it, then, then you will be rewarded in some sense. You know, again, it may not be the fate that you, that you want, but it will be it will be yours. Another. I'm tempted to quote Garth Brooks. Since, since I quoted Horace Walpole, I said, um, remember you thank God, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Sometimes it's true with your major as well. Good. Um, thank you so much for coming. I think you've packed more amazing inspirational information in 25 minutes of talking than I've ever heard in a lecture before. And um, I do miss you in the Tribune as well. Oh, thank you. I um, appreciate that. I'm also an avid lover of narrative nonfiction, and you were spouting off references to great books so fast that 
we wouldn't have been able to write them all down. I have to go back and look at the recording afterwards and take notes, but I wondered if you might have on your website, um, you know, like a list of your favorite narrative nonfiction, and if we can get to it, even though you're in the university system, you know. Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, Thank I you. do. One thing I'm going to, as soon as we're through here today, I brought a bunch of bookmarks because, which has the, a website on it. Um, I do that because I'm a great believer in bookmarks. To me, a bookmark is the most hopeful thing ever. You know, you look at a bookmark and that just, you can sort of chart your progress across that book. And it's just like this wonderful, if you're going to, if you're going to um, give anything to anyone, a bookmark. Yeah, I wrote a column for the Tribune once about bookmarks and I, it must have run nationally somewhere. We're never fully aware of where they run on the wire. I got hundreds and hundreds of bookmarks sent to me from all over the country. <laughs> Amazing. One man hand carved one. There were painted bookmarks. There were, they were just beautiful. People sent me these bookmarks. Now, my column was about all the crazy things we use as a bookmark, like an old gum wrapper, a uh, paper clip. I'm sure you all have the things that you've used, you know, at the last minute, a receipt or a, you know, a deposit ticket. Or a, I read one author who said that she used her deposit tickets as her business cards because she says, heaven knows I never make a deposit. So <laughs> that's a great line. But in any case, so I do. So stick around just for a moment afterward. It, I have um, bookmarks for everyone that will have the website on it. And that's a wonderful idea, actually about listing some of those things. I, I, I apologize if I went too fast. I just, I wanted to give a sense of just the richness in this age we live in now. It, the, the age we live in now of narrative nonfiction is just really, really stunning. I mean, I said, that's the cure. I'm like Merlin, you know, whenever I'm feeling the least bit glum, just a, just a quick scan across the bookshelf and suddenly I'm, I'm back at it again. Thanks. Uh, you alluded to the crisis in the media and I'm noticing that that trend has, has matched pretty precisely in the last five to seven years, a real increase in improving K through 12 science education. But for those of us who are beyond K through 12 education, we would get our science information from the media. Yeah. But there are no, virtually no science sections, much less science writers at any of the major newspapers under the media outlets. Right, except for the New York Times, right. The only one left yeah. with an actual section devoted yeah. to science. And the Tribune has no science writers dedicated any longer. That's right. So my question is kind of, do you have any thoughts on the solution to this when those who are inclined to find that, that greater information, but the resources are shrinking? You know, the point you're making is one that I used to make. I would be there at the Tribune, I would look around and I'd say, we, are, we live in the greatest age of news and information in human history. When people are more interested as ever before, we have a more educated populace than ever before who'd be interested in these things. The lack of a science section there was astonishing. This is Chicago, home of Fermilab, which was until the Large Hadron Collider came online, the largest particle accelerator in the, in the history of the world. I mean, we have, and of course, we have all the great science minds, not just the University of Chicago, but, but, but everywhere. I mean, the university system here. How can that be? We know this community would support it. Um, all I can say is I wasn't in charge. Well, now see, now you're, you're, you're making the, money, the universal money sign, but here's the thing. I think you could make it pay. I think you could make it pay. The books that I mentioned were all bestsellers. These were not books that languished, you know, on, on, the, on the remainder table. These are books that really, really, really sold. We know people are interested in it. Look at the Brian Greene physics books, you know, the ones I mean, uh, The Fabric of the Cosmos. Um, these books, they, they really, really sell. They show that there is a deep hunger for news and information um, about science and so many topics, not just science, but in, environmental writing. That's, that's another one that we really... Um, I, I often say that the, the communities really are either well served or badly served by their newspapers. And I think for a long time, we were very, very well served in the, in the, in the Chicago area by the Tribune. I really do believe that. I think we, we, we were very fortunate. Things happened in the business. I'm sure in your all's businesses they happened too. The, the bottom dropped out of the business. The economic model was no longer sustainable, so we needed to find a new one. So you hope that there's somebody out there right now, and it may be someone in this room. It may be um, a student that... Uh, that you all know, maybe one of, one of your students, John, who right now is going to figure out how do we do it? How do we make digital news and information that is conveyed digitally, how do we make it pay? Right now, nobody knows. Subscription models don't work. Pay-per-view, you know, pay-for-page doesn't really work. What's next? Give away free t-shirts? I, I don't know. But something, something will come along. We know we know it'll work. I just don't know what. But y your question is right. Every time I read the Science Times and the New York Times, which actually, I shouldn't say this, I don't know if there's anybody here from the New York Times, I think it's gotten 
not as rigorous as it used to be. They do a lot of topics now that aren't quite as, I, I think, I used to love reading it because it was always um, challenging. And it was the latest research in a field and they're doing a lot of soft topics now, you know, facial recognition and this kind of stuff and kind of like, what was the one they had the other day that uh, spite is a useful emotion and that seemed like more, of course it is, who doubts that, right? <laughs> Um, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful point, and I hope that somebody, I know somebody right now is working on that. How do you make it pay? Because there's nothing wrong with wanting to make a profit. That's the only thing that, that, that keeps things going. You know, it's, it's, that's, that's, that's what propels. I mean, the mighty engine that what made the United States the greatest country in the history of the world was the Industrial Revolution and our patent system. Our patent system, which, which elevated us to, a, to the forefront um, of science and technology in the world in the late 19th century. So it made us great, even though we were coming out of this terrible civil war. So, you know, again, I know that sounds like um, pretty, pretty thin gruel there upon which to, to base a meal, but it's, um, I really do believe that in my deepest heart. I think we're going to find it. I think we're going to find this way to have that and return that again. Because we are, just as you say, we have students today who are going to still have that great hunger. We're instilling it in them. You know, in a way, we're sort of, we're sort of um, creating the very people that are going to turn around and demand that we do a better job of informing people. And in fact, that's why I loved working for a newspaper, was that very reason, because I love the idea of the common culture. You know, I had this PhD in English literature, and I have friends say, why in the, why, why are you, I love the idea of the newspaper, anybody can come to it, it has all this every day, all this dazzling multiplicity of information. So I love that notion, that it wasn't a specialized thing. Anybody could come to it who wanted to be better informed. I mean, what a glorious notion that is. Hang on just one second, we've got somebody here and then we'll, sure. Response, there is one magazine, yep. that still addresses a variety of scientific topics. And you it's know, on, you, know um, stands. you know why Scientific American originally, not now, but originally in the 19th oh, century, the Scientific American, it was called the Scientific American and it began as a list of patents. Scientific American was begun as a magazine so people could see what all the new patents were has a very noble heritage. We were the first country in the history of the world to have a patent system whereby anybody, no matter who they were, whether you were rich and, and titled or whether you had a dollar in your pocket, could patent and then, and then have the legal right to profit from your invention. Before, in the history of the world, it wasn't like that. You had to know the king or the queen, you had to have a special, special relationship, and um, patents were not an important part of the world until Scientific American. So glad you brought that up. Yes, that is a good magazine. And our technical magazines are good too. I mean, I think Wired is a, is a terrific magazine. Smithsonian is good, yes, yes. Thank you for coming, I appreciate the inspiration. Do you read blogs? And if so, which ones? I do read blogs, a lot of blogs. You know, I, I, uh, from literary criticism, I find the best criticism I read today is on blogs. When I say best, I don't always mean positive. I know of my own books. It's nice if they like it, but I'll take a good, incisive, you know, critique over just kind of vague praise any day. Um, I'm trying to think of the names of the literary blogs. You know, I've got them on my list. I read the um, the Millions is, is one I particularly like. I mean, there are a lot of I mean, sort of blog website. It's a little bit of slippage in there in the terms. Are there ones that you particularly? There's such a wide range. That's why I was interested. Yeah. To hear, you know, especially on this science and arts theme, if there are some that address that in particular. There's a, you know, there's a website called artsjournal.com, all one word, artsjournal.com, has a blog role on the right-hand side that are some of the really, really good blogs on these topics, arts and sciences. Um, on, there's a really good drama and dance site in there and, and the more scientific topic as well. Look at the, that blog role on the right. Now, some of you may also read Arts and Letters Daily, aldaily.com. On their left-hand rail is a blog roll that you can't go wrong with. You know, you'll be, you'll go, even the titles won't entice you. Little Green Footballs is one. Um, they're, they're just great, as you say, there's so many of them, and they're easy to sample. So arts and letters, or artsjournal.com, right-hand side, artsandlettersdaily.com, left-hand side. There'll be blog rolls going down both sides that are really, really good. But as I said, literary blogs, some of the best, some of the best critical writing today is in literary blogs. Thanks. It's funny to be called inspirational and optimistic. I really didn't in, in, intend to come across that way. I prefer dour and glum. And, <laughs> but, 
So I, uh, somehow there seems to be like less intellectual seriousness or something. Um, I should say real quickly too that your art gallery here on campus um, has a particle accelerator. And if you want to see something really cool, it's a, a decommission that's not currently running, which is good because we'd all be bathed in radiation. But uh, I'm sure there are a lot of leaks now after all the years. But it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful machine. And it's one of those things that just kind of sort of reifies your, your belief in the, in the human hunger to, to go further and to keep pushing. So, you know, particle accelerators now, and then, with, then came the Tevatron, and then came the LHC in Geneva, Switzerland. But this is the Kevatron, and it's just a beautiful machine at your art gallery here on campus. I encourage you just to walk over and look at it and kind of think, wow. Yes, sir. Um, as a reporter and writer, I. I have been inspired by your work, and I uh, keep, keep uh, showing people the Pulitzer pieces that you wrote um, and going, I wish I could have done that. Um, <laughs> but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the aspirational nature of art and science. Um, we talk about inspiration, but one of the things that concerned me that, that you talked about tonight was your students going, why do we want to do yeah. that? We're this or that, and which says to me there's a lack of curiosity. Um, which is essential to a good reporter, a good writer. There's not an aspirational sense to, to be more. And I was wondering yeah. if you could talk about that as well as, do we even um, encourage that any, anymore? You know, because think, whether they be the way they're taught or in culture, there doesn't seem to be much focus on aspiration. You know, that's a, that's a really great question, because I think that intellectual curiosity is something I would maintain, I think it is born inside every child, absolutely. I mean, I would argue that to my dying breath. It gets squashed out over the years. I'm sure there's a more elegant phrase for it, but we, it gets a little bit squashed out. I know with my students, I mentioned student debt, are we talking about that? For a lot of them, they have that intellectual curiosity, but they don't feel that they have that can. I mean, I made a joke about Twitter and Facebook and the Kardashians, but that's not a battle I'm ever going to win. Um, but truly, I think we, we kind of beat it out of people. You know, we kind of, we, we, we're not a society right now that has a lot of that questing. I mean, we see with what's happened with a lot of our science funding. Um, there just isn't that sense quite as much as we've had before. I don't know why. You know, sometimes these large cultural trends, they're hard to get their hands around. You just kind of know it. I think some of you know what I mean. It'd be really hard if somebody said, well, quantify that. How do you quantify the lack of intellectual curiosity among today's young people? We can't quantify it. We just kind of feel it. And I suppose you could argue that feelings shouldn't be the basis of legislation or, or, or you know, large bureaucratic changes. But nonetheless, I think you are really onto something aspirational, which is always that, that leaning forward that I mentioned. You know, a man's reach must exceed his grasp, or what's the heaven for? Uh, that well-known journalist, Robert Browning. Um, so I, I think it's a very, very important point that's almost um, maybe the most we can do. You know, we're not specialists in particular things, so you all probably the experience of being around young, young children. They're asking you some terribly complicated question, like, why is the sky dark at night when you have all those stars out there? Why is it dark? Which sounds like, oh, that's a little kitty question. Well, my friend the astrophysicist said, actually, it's a very complicated question. It's very complex. It's not an easy answer. So we, we may not have that answer at our fingertips, but to say, that is a really great, quest great question. Let's try to figure that out. That's something that's so wonderful about our, our computers now and in the internet. We do have that, have that right there um, at our fingertips. But if there's anything you could encourage, you know, it would be that. But I do, I see, I see people kind of getting that squashed out of them every day through um, economic issues, through just the uncertainty about the future. I do think there is a kind of an unease about our culture now. Um, you know, we still have this place that we have in the world, but there is a kind of an unease out there. There's an unsettledness that we're all kind of feeling, like kind of a low murmur that we're kind of dealing with now. And we're figuring out what to do about it. What, what can we do, you know, on a large global sense? And also, what can we do on a smaller sense every day in each of our lives? Um, whenever I kind of get too wild with my abstractions, I always remember, um, you know, Thoreau, who said, the way you spend your days is the way you spend your life. So if there's ever a moment when you're thinking of just kind of like wasting an afternoon, it's like, I remember him saying that. And then I think, oh, he's dead anyway. What did he know? But <laughs> it's a way of remembering that it's a daily thing, you know, a daily thing that you go to, that these, these kinds of, um, 
these kinds of, of inspirations, as it were. And there's just nothing more important. I mean, I try to do it with my students, and I, and I worry sometimes that it does sound a little bit foolish when I say, oh, hang in there, you know, hang in there and push and try and all that. I know you've got almost $100,000 in debt, but hang in there. You know, that, <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't go very far. Um, but I just have to believe that. I just have to believe that at the end, at the end that we're heading there. Some do, some do. Um, I have to say not as many as I would like. You know, I, I should admit to you right here, I mean, I don't think I'm a very good teacher. I've had some extraordinary teachers. I'm not there. I would like to say I'm not there yet, but who knows. Um, I think great teachers, if I were a better teacher, I think they would, they would do better at that. I think sometimes, um, you know, it is, it's this mysterious process. You know, there are people who can know a thing, and then there are people who can know it and teach it. And they're completely, those of you who are teachers here know what I mean, they're completely different skills. I feel like I know a lot about writing. I feel like I have a lot to impart about writing. I'm not sure that I'm able yet to, to instill that same kind of um, curiosity and, and vigor and respect for language in my students yet. And again, it's not their fault, that's what I'm saying. If I were a better teacher, they would be, they would be better. But some do, some do come through. They know what I mean and they, they kind of get after it. And, um, and some don't, you know, there's a, but as I said, I, I would take more of the blame on, I, I, I know I sound like one of those coaches, you, you know, when the team is completely lost, it was on me, and you know they don't really mean it, but, <laughs> but I really do mean it. I think there are some extraordinary teachers. You have some here. I know I had dinner with several teachers uh, that, that you all have had right here on campus, and you're just very, very fortunate. You, know, you can always tell. You can tell when the first 10 minutes of conversation with somebody, can't you? Really? I mean, you really, it's not... You can always tell. You probably know within the first 10 minutes of a class whether this is, this is going to be one that really has something to offer you or not. So um, again, as I said, these are, these are huge problems. These are, these are giant monumental problems. But the very fact that you're all here tonight and we're talking about it, that we recognize that um, you know, every human life has one duty, which is, to, which is to fulfill its capacities, that individual's capacities. I mean, I would never have any, if a student is doing the best they can, then that's fine with me. But it's not using your gifts and your talents to their fullest. That, to me, is the real sin, and probably the only sin. I hate to get theological here, but all the rest of it, you know, all the rest of it, like, um, uh, you know, coveting thy neighbor's wife and all the other terrible sins and lying and cheating and stealing and fornicating and all that. Yes, they, see it there, I said it, fornicating. Um, those aren't real. Those are human frailties, and we all do what we do. But not living up to your gifts and talents, not using your capabilities to their fullest extent, um, when you get to the end of your life, that will be the one, that will be the one true sin. That will be the one that, that I think haunts you. And don't forget, please, when we're through this evening, to, to come by and get a bookmark. All right? Take it with you. Any other questions? Let's thank Julia Keller for joining us. Thank you very much.